Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. So this morning, I'm going to continue my tradition of reading out loud to you, so you can be like kindergartners again. <laughs> Just listen. Um, we'll post um, the uh, text that I'm reading from with its images. Um, um, so, but first, <coughs> a little bit of a recap. So some of you are not familiar with this book so far. So um, I'm in the middle of a book project with uh, other Sangha members developing a book about the history and evolution of Apamata and its basic fundamental principles. And it's been just a joy and a delight to work on and to, uh, to share with folks. As we've been preparing it, we've put it up on the web as a serial because uh, I want people to have access to it as soon as possible. And not everyone is familiar with this background, but anyway, the first part, part one, was really about the background of Flint and I and how we got connected with our first teachers in Zen. And the second part of it was about our formal training in the way, so how we came to be ordained and how we came to have Dharma transmission. And the third part of it is about the actual birth of Apamata, and that's the part I'm working on now. So, um, so I'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, in 2005, I had moved this uh, tiny homeless Zazen sitting group I had led on Sundays to this space, uh, to this house. And we had adopted the name Ordinary Mind which Joko had named her school. From 2001, I was also training at Austin Zen Center, where I was ultimately ordained. I left AZC in 2006 to focus all of my energies on this emerging Sangha. Soon we had expanded from our regular Sunday morning program to offer Zazen and service weekday mornings and Wednesday evenings and to other classes and to offer classes and, and uh, one day intensives and things like that. We're just starting to get rolling. Um, before I start part three, chapter 10 of our book, I'll briefly recap the last part of chapter nine, which gives a little bit of an intro, you know, so we can be, uh, that part I'm not going to display, I'm just going to tell you. Um, <clears throat> but I will share the screen so we can make sure that we actually can do that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can see that. Um, okay, so basically, uh, June 30th, 2007, uh, six months after I had left AZC, Flint joined me at Ordinary Mind, so he came and joined me here, seeing clients in the study, holding inquiry on Tuesdays here, uh, and offering practice discussion while we planned the design and building of the little house in back, which was to become his office. We had become fully liberated. So this next section, is the last section is called Liberating Intimacy. For the mind in harmony with the Tao, all selfishness disappears. With not even a trace of self-doubt, you can trust the universe completely. All at once you are free, with nothing left to hold on to. All is empty, brilliant, perfect in its own being. This is from Shin Shin Ming, and this is exactly how we felt. We began talking about how we wanted to teach in a fresh perspective we were calling relational Zen. It would incorporate some of the psychological concepts we had studied, Hakomi, internal family systems, spiral dynamics, but it would have its deep foundation in Zen teachings and practice. Still, there was my question. Would our focus on relational practices in addition to meditation lead us and our Sangha astray from the authentic teachings and practice of Zen? Would it devolve into Zen light, seen as superficial or new age? The traditional institution of Zen stretched back over 700 years in Japan, and even beyond that, to the origins of Chan in China in the 5th or 6th century CE. So we Americans were upstarts. Who were we to meddle with tradition? Flint said he had a book on his shelf that might have some bearing on this question, but he hadn't read it yet. He brought it from his office, Liberating Intimacy, by Peter Hershock. If you haven't read it, you should. It, I opened it and began reading out loud from the introduction. It was a revelation. It's a scholarly history of Chan, Zen, Buddhism's origins in China. In it, Hershok focuses on a radical rethinking of Zen history. 
Zen is not merely the practice of seated meditation, but of direct encounter, the liberating potential of relationship. It was a distinctly Chinese contribution to Buddhist teachings. Chan was revolutionary not in not centering on sutra study or lectures by Buddhist teachers or even solitary meditation. It was based on direct experience in this very moment and it was most alive in the encounter. The Chan student challenging a teacher, two masters meeting on a road, an old woman selling rice cakes, asking a traveling scholar the question that stumps him. Excuse me. So we read Hershock's illuminating book together over several weeks, captivated by its brilliant insights and elegant prose. Our focus on relational Zen was not, to our relief, some modern whim the, uh, <clears throat> diluting traditional Zen. It was a return to Zen's original expression, the realization that we wake up in relating with a master, with an old woman at a well, with a peach tree in full bloom. In the immediacy of direct encounter without filters, in the open, spacious place cultivated in meditation, we are not to. <clears throat> this surprising book at precisely the right time gave us confidence that our instincts and teaching methods were actually true to the original teachings of Zen. How had it ever been turned into some solitary quest and isolating practice? I said to Flint, from here on, we will have to grow each other. There are no teachers for this way. In fact, some years later, we invited Peter Hershock to Appamata to teach a one-day workshop. He admired what we were doing with the saga as we talked to him about it. Um, and he said, you're putting into practice what I can only write about. But there were some clouds on the horizon. Joko had publicly disavowed two of her Dharma heirs. In response, some of her other Dharma heirs wrote a letter strongly and disrespectfully, in my view, criticizing Joko. The ordinary mind school was coming apart. So that's a bit of the backstory. Um, for the rest of it, you'll need to read part one and two, which is you know, linked on our website. Um, you can find it there. So now we start part three, and that's where Okamata really makes an appearance, a full appearance. So <coughs> this is the start of part three. Um, each of these parts has a unique color. Um, so this is the color for part three. This chapter, chapter 10, is called Becoming Who We Are. And it starts with this little verse. The unique breeze of reality, can you see? Continuously, creation moves her loom and shuttle, weaving the ancient brocade, incorporating the forms of spring. As the woof goes through the warp, the weave is dense and fine. One continuous thread comes from the shuttle. How can this even be spoken of on the same day as faults, cause, or no cause? This is from a Dharma talk by Leslie James. <coughs> so, becoming who we are. 2008 was an eventful year. I had just been appointed director of the Undergraduate Writing Center at UT. It was a fraught mission. My department chair was in a bitter conflict with the center staff. The 85 graduate student consultants were feeling burdened and resentful <coughs> at having to work there. The windowless space was overcrowded and noisy, and the staff had been gamely struggling to manage, following four years of absentee leadership and no support. I was also teaching classes and supervising graduate students. In the spring, my dear friend John died after his long battle with leukemia, and we also lost a devoted Sangha member and benefactor, Margaret Harrison, both devastating losses. Meanwhile, the construction of the little house and back continued, requiring myriad decisions. It was a delight to have Flint and Aaron collaborating on them, and it was finally ready for Flint to move in in April. Then, in the middle of one night in May, I was startled awake by flashes of light outside my bedroom window. Sheets of lightning, sheets of lightning. I had never seen such a thing before. I saw that the power was out. <clears throat> okay, as you can see, there, um, there's some images of what happened. And I got out of bed to get the flashlight in the kitchen. In the darkness, I had the surreal experience of walking barefoot on what seemed to be shards of ice and glass in a hallway in the middle of the house. That hallway. Was I dreaming? It was pitch black and no way to know. 
Just as I arrived at the kitchen, I heard a tremendous roar which soon engulfed me in a powerful wall of sound that hammered me like physical blows, while a battering on the roof felt like concrete blocks were being fired at the house by cannons. I stood utterly still, like a wild animal, <clears throat> waiting. It was an immediate experience of bare awareness, without thoughts, feelings, or even physical sensations. Just now, just this. Time suspended, space transcended. Abruptly as it had begun, it was over, and there was only silence. I took the flashlight and headed back to my room, discovering that the hallway was indeed filled with broken ice and glass, blown in from the bathroom window. My bedroom, though, was mysteriously filled with tree branches, walls plastered with leaves, windows shattered and broken glass everywhere. The windows had imploded inward. <clears throat> I stared at the surreal scene. If I had not left the room exactly at the right moment, I was too dazed to comprehend it, so I just went to bed in the guest bedroom. The power was still out in the morning, it was still dark, as I showered and quickly dressed. When Wendy and Leela arrived for morning zazen, they looked shaken by what they saw. And as it grew light, we discovered that the roof of the main house, this house, was destroyed and seven windows had imploded. There were drifts of large hail in the backyard and bits of leaves plastered on all four sides of the house. <coughs> Landmarks of a tornado, those are the sort of the hallmarks of a tornado, right? It's got that, and it, and it probably started right here. <clears throat> the neighbors' houses were mostly untouched, but there was a slender path of destruction all the way down to the capital, where the tornado had uprooted some 300-year-old oaks. I had narrowly escaped injury, or worse. In a powerful embodied experience, I was shown how impermanence is not simply a Buddhist concept we need to comprehend. Our default assumption is permanence, that the way things are is the way things will stay, a world without end. Yet, this assumption has never been supported by our actual lived experience. It is a futile, grasping faith in illusion. The proof of impermanence keeps crashing into our habits, routines, expectations. The orderly worlds we create or struggle to are flung up against a universe of chaos, which we instinctively dread. <clears throat> in Zazen, <coughs> excuse me, in Zazen, we confront our denial, our distress and confusion about our human predicament. Slowly, we learn to accept the reality of impermanence, to allow ourselves to taste it, to abide in it. So when impermanence shows its incomprehensible, casual power, rudely barging in, tearing the roof off our happy home, battering us with icy hail, uprooting our ancient trees and flinging them about, we learn to be still, to be watchful, to trust. Impermanence washes over us every moment, but usually we try not to notice. Sometimes it has to beat us over the head for us to awaken, to meet it right where we are, in the middle of the night, in the middle of our terribly fragile lives. We're always walking on broken glass on ice. We just don't know it. Zen is a sanctuary not because it shelters us from uncertainty, loss, and change, but because it teaches us how to make our home in the vast cosmos where these forces are constantly at play. It situates, situates us in the midst of this great activity, the creative intelligence of the universe, constantly unfolding and enfolding our lives. Even the most powerful tornado is impermanent. When it passes, we begin again, sweeping up shards of glass, clearing away broken limbs, repairing the roof, because that's what we do. We tell stories like this one, not to enshrine the past, but to recall and share its vital lessons. That is how our species grows in wisdom. And ultimately, there was a bright side. In rebuilding the roof, we were able to extend it and create a welcoming entry deck in place of the old concrete stoop. The radiant display of permanence and impermanence begins again, and we dance in its light. Summer brought the heat of a fraught political campaign <clears throat> and in November, Ben surprised me with plane tickets to be in Chicago and witnessed, together with a jubilant ocean of people in Grand Park, newly elected President Barack Obama take the stage. Certainly one of the most profound moments in our lives. <clears throat> but then, towards the end of the year, we faced an existential dilemma for the saga. 
In a phone call, Joko's senior student, Barb, told me Joko wanted to start a new school led by Barb Flint and me. Joko had disavowed the teachers of the Ordinary Mind School. We made plans to visit Joko to discuss this development in December. Still, one thing was clear. We were going to have to change our song this name. But how could we find a new name? Ordinary Mind had seemed so perfect for our sangha. It connected us directly with Joko and her pragmatic contemporary model of Zen, stripped down to its essentials. It reflected our intention to serve householders, not priests or monks. And it had originated from an ancient koan we cherished, Ordinary Mind is the Way, Case 19 and the Gateless Gate, which conveniently we have right here on the page. <laughs> Ordinary Mind is the Way, the Case. Joshu earnestly asked Nansen, what is the way? Nansen ans answered, the ordinary mind is the way. Joshu asked, should I direct myself toward it or not? Nansen said, if you try to turn toward it, you go against it. Joshu asked, if I do not try to turn toward it, how can I know that it is the way? Nansen answered, the way does not belong to knowing or not knowing. Knowing is delusion, not knowing is a blank, is blank consciousness. When you have really reached the true way beyond all doubt, you will find it as vast and boundless as the great empty firmament. How can it be talked about on a level of right and wrong? At these words, Joshua was suddenly enlightened. And you see there the image of the calligraphy that we have on the wall here, <coughs> which translates as ordinary or natural or everyday mind is just the way. Although there's no articles in Japanese, so it's not the way, it's just way. Um, so it's not the way, it's not a way among many ways, it's just way. So further, Nonen Chowani's large calligraphy of Ordinary Mind is the Way was hanging in the Zendo. We could not imagine another name as appropriate as this for our Sangha, dedicated not to monks or priest training, but for householders in their everyday lives. This section is called Losing Our Ordinary Mind. <laughs> a naming dilemma. We surveyed the Sangha for their suggestions. Lotus blossom, clear water, empty sky, but nothing seemed quite right. And there was the technological challenge. A bit of searching revealed that it would be pretty much impossible to get the domain name <clears throat> uh, for a website needed for a website using Japanese or English Zen words or even Buddhist terms in Pali, Samadhi, Kensho, Karuna, Dana, Prajna, and so on. All of these had been snapped up years ago by other sanghas, yoga studios, wellness centers, and even bars. <laughs> Maybe we could consider some combination with a place name, Meta Austin? This kind of mashup seemed ungainly, and suppose we develop sanghas in other places, like England. <laughs> We were too late to the internet party and we had no ideas, which was very rare for Flint and I. Weeks passed and we were going to have to decide soon. <clears throat> We'd received pointed inquiries from teachers in the Ordinary Mind School about who had authorized us to use the name Ordinary Mind and Joko was no longer associated with them. Kind of Finally, at them. the very end of the year, Flint reminded me of a Stephen Batchelor article we had read a few years earlier based on a talk Bachelor had given at the Berry Center. It was titled, Buddha's Last Word, Care. A thoughtful translation and interpretation of one of the Buddha's last words to his followers. When his disciples had asked the dying Buddha whether they should follow this teacher or that teacher after he was gone, he said, be an island unto yourselves, fare forward with apamada. Bachelor wrote that this term, usually translated as diligence or heedfulness, actually means more accurately, mindful, energetic care, apamata. So here's what Bachelor said about that. The word in Pali is apamata, which is actually a negative term. The a, as in Greek, means not, and pamata translates as something like heedlessness. It's difficult to find an English term that gives the same positive sense. One of the examples, a person who is suffering from pamada is a person who has somehow lost control. A drunk, somebody who's completely out of it on alcohol, is said to be in a state of pamada, and we probably all have some sense of what that means, perhaps even in some cases from first-hand experience. 
It is a state in which one is really no longer very coherent, a state in which one is perhaps rather careless in what one says and what one does, a state in which one may in fact be quite unaware of what's going on, such that the next morning, when you meet the friends you were with the night before, you can't actually recall what it is they say that you did or said. In this sense, pamata is a loss of consciousness, or at least a rather chaotic, unfocused, unstructured kind of consciousness that very often leads to regret and perhaps even despair. We stared at each other in wonder. Our new name had appeared and, surprisingly enough, I found that the domain name, apamata.org, was available. All the signs pointed in one direction. The name is like a constellation in the night sky, scattered points of brilliant light against the dark, drawn into patterns and stories that we tiny mortals gazing upward into the cosmos seem to need. But how would the Sangha respond? <clears throat> Apamata by design. Meanwhile, just a little bit, Ben was designing a word mark, a set of style guidelines, and a website for the new identity. Here's what he wrote about his guidelines in our Apamata style. And you can see over to the right our business card, um, and its unconventional size was designed to avoid paper waste. So Ben wrote, <clears throat> I, I love this, sometimes you know your own kid surprises you. He really surprised me with this. He wrote, Apamata speaks with easy confidence. It never shouts or whispers. This is one way to illustrate the care we provide. Because design is the first word we speak to our audience, it's important to say hello with just the right tone. It's with this awareness that the design vocabulary of Apamata has been crafted. It's a vocabulary of simple, well-chosen words which communicate clearly. By assembling them in different ways, we can say absolutely anything with style. The design steps out of the way. It does not need to drum up new business or command attention. Freed from the duties of a salesperson, it can dedicate itself to elegantly presenting and framing its contents. This design aims to be handsome, but unobtrusive, never distracting. The effect is that the contents leap off the page because they don't have to compete with anything else. And he wrote, the Apamata logo is an elegant geometric word mark. It's hard to overstate its importance within the design. It has such a special role that there are a number of specific guidelines to keep in mind regarding its use. And he followed with many guidelines, which I won't give you. <laughs> but in the style guidelines, Ben established our official type typeface as Univer, which he explained. Adrian Frutiger's Univer is considered by many to be the single greatest achievement in sans serif type design. It is both friendlier and more thoughtful than its chubbier, bubblier, contemporary Hel Helvetica, which re was released the same year. So this just cracked me up for some reason. I mean. We have a proprietary typeface that we have to use on all of our, all of our designs. <clears throat> all of our handouts, signs, and printed materials use this typeface, and you may notice it is the typeface used in this book. Thanks to Ben's care, Apamata's serene, timeless, and warm design style was firmly established before Apamata even existed, officially, organizing the new identity. So you can see on the right, um, some examples that's not so easy to see on the screen is the way the images project, but there are examples of the signs around Apamata and the use of the Univer typeface. Um, our signature gray, which was also specified in the style guidelines, um, and a different saturated pop of color for each sign, um, which was um, Ben's design with a type in white. So even our signage expresses Apamata's contemporary Zen aesthetic, including a bit of surprise and delight. So I set up an email list on Google so that everyone would be in place, everything would be in place when we were ready. We filed amendments to the Articles of Incorporation for the state with the new name and filed our nonprofit corporation name change with the IRS as well. But we kept the name a secret until we could introduce it properly. We began to plan a one week intensive to share the name and the teachings around it, including the Apamata Sutra, the Bachelor article, an article on this term Apamata by Banisaru Bhikkhu, and other readings, and we prepared talks about the guiding principles of our Sangha reflected in this name. 
But first, we needed to find some place to hold the intensive for the end of May 2009. We were fortunate to discover an ideal location. Lotus Lake Zen Community is situated on 30 wooded acres near Houston in Magnolia. The community is a group of Taiwanese Chan, Taiwanese Chan Buddhists led by Master Dong Bei. Their primary practice is outdoor walking. It has thousands of followers in Taiwan and uh, here in this country. Um, that's their primary practice. They have built houses there for families and dormitories for visiting students. Because the community takes its meals together, there's a huge communal kitchen and dining room. The meditation hall is enormous, circular with an enclosed walkway around it and polished hardwood floors. But the truly astonishing feature was the wooden boardwalks they built, creating winding pathways through the entire 30 acres of forest. The teacher had insisted that the paths be built without harming a single tree, even a tiny sapling. These meandering walkways form a network of paths the community uses for its practice. They asked for a schedule so that they could make themselves invisible, doing Tai Chi on the deck and walking the practice before we arose, eating all together in someone's home. It was incredibly generous. They had created a lake there, Lotus Lake, with a beautiful wooden bridge across it. You can see the pathways and the, you can see the bridge. Push up a little bit. <coughs> And that's the main zendo there. It's actually a, a hexagon, I think. Um, <clears throat> they had created a lake there, Lotus Lake, with a beautiful wooden bridge across it. It was home to fish and water lilies in full bloom, herons, frogs, and dragonflies. The setting was enchanting, and we would return for residential intensives over several years. The last year was beastly hot, and a savage drought had dried up the lake and was killing off the trees. The fish, lotuses, and herons were gone. Only the bridge remained. In the kitchen, Artenzo and cooks worked over hot stoves with no air conditioning, while temperatures outside soared to 105 degrees. <coughs> the first Apamata intensive. But for this first week-long intensive, especially, Lotus Lake was magical, lush, and filled with promise. 17 Sangha members attended. Flint and I were delighted to be teaching together and bringing this new identity to our Sangha. Here's my talk explaining the new name. Apamana, a fundamental orientation. This intensive, I might say that about our last instance too, and in a larger sense, this Sangha is profound and wondrous, but I didn't want this. No I could ever want such a thing. The whole activity is the result of a harmonic convergence between the wheel of Dharma set in motion by the Buddha 2,500 years ago, and your deep aspiration for truth and intimacy. No matter how feeble, intermittent, or defective, you believe <coughs> that aspiration may be. <coughs> Somehow, we are all profoundly, wholeheartedly here together. Is good so far? Mm -hmm. okay, so far? Okay. This great activity can never arise in solitary practice, no matter how devout, nor in the bustle of our everyday lives. It is the manifestation of our shared intention through which the full realization of this path is actualized. As the Buddha within each one of you, the Dharma that is the teachings of truth at its most immediate and personal, and the Sangha as the embodiment of our interdependence and mutual care. No I can even comprehend such activity. We meet in this intimate encounter, and in every moment, new expressions of who we are born. <clears throat> Each, every arising is our, of our, is our consciousness playing with new forms and processes, yet over and over again, we miss it. Apamata is about not missing out on your own life. It is not about being kind to puppies and old ladies. There's a fierceness in it. It does not expect gratitude or approval or even a positive effect, yet it is a responsive function. You can't assume a lack of care because the whole activity looks nothing like caregiving. So let's take a closer look at what we believe the Buddha meant when he encouraged his followers to fare forward with Apamata. So Stephen Batchelor described it this way, Apamata is not just the occasional mindful thought or attentive state of mind. 
it is more than just being mindful. It has to do with that primary ethical or moral or orientation we have in life with, with which we bring into being whatever activity we're engaged in, whether in formal meditation, in our interactions with other people, in our social concerns, or in our political choices. It's the energetic cherishing of what we regard as good. <clears throat> Earlier, Flint had given a wonderful introduction to Apamata through the contemporary teachings of Stephen Batchelor and the Sutra of the Elephant's Footprint. So Buddha described Apamata as the elephant's footprint, which is so large it can hold the footprint of all the other animals. It can hold all of his teachings. <clears throat> We were struck by, by these pieces, which resonated so perfectly with our aspirations for our work. It was just this quality of aliveness and mindful care that so astounded me when I first met Flint, and it continues to touch me with its profound manifestations in the simplest tiny gestures. Most of you have witnessed countless examples of this kind of care in your own lives. When we encounter this quality, we are drawn to it. And possibly, Many other thoughts and feelings come up for you when you hear the meaning of Apamata. Some of them may be a bit conflicted. <clears throat> Most of us have had a lifetime of being told what to care about from our parents, teachers, friends, workplaces, and of course, media. The list is endless. Clean teeth, good grades, straight posture, our diet, the war in Ukraine or in the Middle East. Mind you, this was in 2009. We still have the war in Ukraine. Mm. We still have the war in the Middle East. <clears throat> our children, the quarterly sales figures, identity theft, our aging parents, swine flu, terrorists, the stock market, health insurance, recession, and on and on. The spiritual path adds a new layer to our care package, what we should not care about, as well as what we should. So we should care about virtue, salvation, our neighbor, enlightenment, great teachers, this present moment, compassion, and so on. And we should not care about personal gain, celebrity, money, fame, sports scores, fun, and so on. We have mixed reactions to these demands and expectations for what we should care about. Some of our reactions may be positive. We feel honored or privileged, responsive, trying to be good, gain attention, or compete in some way. Some reactions are negative. We may feel overwhelmed, burdened, resentful, claustrophobic, depressed, anxious. Some reactions may be fairly neutral. We engage in rationalizing. You have to take care of your family, right? Or prioritizing. I, don't, I can't care about the genocide in Darfur until I get my mother settled in the nursing home. Dissociating. What did you say, dear? Or distractions. What about those longhorns? When we hear about Abamata, we may feel that we are being asked again to care in this way. Yet we are not talking about this sense of care as something we do, say, or think towards something, something, someone, or some situation. There's a difference between taking care of and taking care with. Taking care with does not reflect me, an object, such as another person, and something I'm doing to or for that object. We take care with our whole body and mind, taking care with an unfolding situation, together with everyone else in the situation. We do this in full recognition that there is just this one activity, a full and complete manifestation of the whole cosmos right where we are. And we are wholeheartedly participating within that activity. Even our refusal to play, our turning away, or seeking some distractions are still the means of our participation in that activity. Apamata is not something you do. Sorry. Apamata is not something you do or even an attitude toward. It is a kind of recalling where you are and freeing the energy that wants to move through you. Giving and receiving that flow of energy and information without hindrance is apamata. We call it something like energetic, mindful care or active, watchful care to distinguish it from the passive sense of caring about something. It may manifest as passionate action or even silent reading. You might also think of it as attending right here and right now. This is as good a description of nirvana as you will find in any circumstance. And as you begin to notice the nearly invisible web of care that supports and sustains your entire life, the most common response is profound gratitude. 
Appamata flows through it. Here's just one example. Someone has to decide to be a dentist, spend years of study and lab work, plus a great deal of money to establish a practice, needs to be good enough to attract patients, and build up enough of a base so that he or she can be available just for that brief amount of time that you will need a filling. There's a receptionist, equipment, phones, and insurance to pay for, advertising and websites to be designed and published. There are annual conventions and ongoing research and medical journals to keep up with. The dentist probably has to maintain a house, a car, and a family, take vacations, and take care with his or her own physical health, with diet, exercise, and medical care. Retirement and taxes need to be planned for, food and clothing purchased, cell phones and computers managed. Need I go on? You, together with your dentist, are, you hope, engaged in apamata, energetic, mindful care of your mouth. You take care of your part of that activity when you brush regularly and follow the dentist's suggestions and stay off skateboards. <laughs> the dentist takes care with your teeth with skills and knowledge and experience. Yet you may also feel anxious and fearful about the experience, this whole activity. You may resent your own teeth when you are in pain. You may dread even the thought of a visit to the dentist. You long for reassurance and comfort when the reality is, well, whatever it is. <clears throat> so I'm going to read this little piece by uh, Ahe Dogen, which will be very familiar to some folks who are here from the intensive. The zazen I speak of is not learning meditation. It is simply the Dharma gate of repose and bliss, the practice realization of totally culminated enlightenment. It is the manifestation of ultimate reality. Traps and snares can never reach it. Once its heart is grasped, you're like the dragon gaining the water, like the tiger entering the mountain. So I have some images there of the repose and bliss of the intensive. Um, you can see that. <clears throat> Do you see how this is, all of this is one activity? And given the life you are in, you have complete freedom in how you play it. How do you understand the quality of Appamata? Um, how do you understand the quality of Appamata as that participation that is truly free, completely present, absolutely awake? Now, magnify this one example of your dentist times every person, process, technology, or institution that participates in the activity you call my life. In an intensive, we intentionally simplify this life so that the great activity of Appamata is more apparent. In a fruit salad topped with snipped fresh mint, in the cleaning of bathrooms, in the hospitality of this beautiful setting. We are not talking about something you should take care of, nor something you should care about. We are talking about that vast, boundless activity we are awakened to, dynamic present moment attention and its wholehearted expression through this body, heart, and mind. The Buddha said that Appamata is the path to the deathless, and that all skillful qualities of mind are rooted in Appamata, converge in Appamata, and have Appamata as the foremost among them. This is precisely the elephant footprint. So here we are in this remarkable environment, in that remarkable environment, Moon, sliver, lotus blossom, Texas spring, and I can't help thinking about the frogs. Consider the completely present, silent stillness in a frog of a frog in repose, entirely awake, entirely at ease, until that moment a fly crosses her field of view. The response is immediate, yet only what is precisely necessary in that moment. Then just as immediately, the frog returns to stillness and silence and ease. This is what is meant by enlightenment is an appropriate response. The frog takes care of the fly, takes care with the fly, hit or miss. So Stephen Batchelor said, so apamata is a word for care, but it's more than that somehow. It's very difficult to find the right word in English. Apamata is that intention which guides us and directs us and inspires us, that energizes us, that commits us to what it is we consider to be good. We can summarize that as wisdom, compassion, tolerance, all the virtues Buddhism encourages. But remember, Appamata is the frame that encloses them all. In other words, Appamata is perhaps best thought of, not as a state of mind, but more as of a perspective, an orientation, or a sensibility. It is a commitment to what we honor as good. And at the same time, it guards the mind against what gives rise to affliction. There's something protective about this commitment to what is good. 
guarding us against those impulses and drives and habits of mind that seek to subvert and overwhelm and distract us from the goal. The quality of Appamata is relational. Energetic, mindful care is a relational expression, not an individual approach. Mu Song speaks of relationality rather than relationship. Why? Because relationship is a noun that solidifies and simplifies but can only be experienced as a complex dynamic process. And because it further constructs subjects and objects, me and what I am related with or to. Me in relationship with a partner, a work situation, myself, the environment, and so on. So soon we have these three objects identified, you, me, and the thing called our relationship, which can have all the attributes of a person, healthy, unhealthy, conflicted, stormy, calm, anxious, trusting, damaged, and so on. This leads to strange constructions such as, you don't really care about our relationship, do you? As if you had a child between you or a houseplant that's being abused or neglected. Or, I wanna talk with you about our relationship, and so on, weird. There's no such thing as a relationship. There's only relating. Relationality is a more open term describing a kind of potential or functioning aspect, the degree or quality of readiness for intimacy, for connecting. It's a fundamental orientation toward being with, attuning, and responding. It is that orientation toward that is the living embodiment of Appamata. How will that affect your particular life and dilemmas and difficulties? Only you can find out. Only you can do the experiment in mutuality and observe what shifts. <clears throat> Within you and around you, when you take up the Buddha's invitation and encouragement to fare forward with Appamata, you have the support and care of your teachers and the Sangha. What will you discover? We needn't have worried about the Sangha's response. They love the new name. So you can read more of the, um, or listen to all the talks from that intensive um, on the website if you like. Um, they're all there in the uh, intensive files. So that was that talk. That was our opening talk. That was what set the scene. Appamata's place in the universe. Ironically, a few years later, I was at a Soto Zen Buddhist Association conference, an august gathering of ordained priests and Dharma transmitted teachers. A young Dharma teacher looked at my name tag and deliberately mispronouncing it, sniffed, Apameda. What kind of name is that? It was a great pleasure to tell him that it had been the Buddha's last word and to explain its meaning. It has never failed to surprise me that Appamata is a term unknown by so many Buddhist teachers and even scholars, considering its important place, important place in the Buddhist teaching and his last word to his disciples. It has turned out to be the perfect name for our Sangha, our way of teaching and our shared aspirations. It is with a mindful, energetic care that we regard the Buddha, the teachings, and each other. And it is mindful, energetic care we endeavor to practice in thought, word, and action. So we have contributions from Sangha members are part of this book, giving their reflections about these experiences. And this one is from Joan Harmon. She writes, The Birth of Appamata. I have been a consistent participant at Ordinary Mind Sangha for almost two years when Peg announced in 2009 the opportunity of a residential week-long intensive. That was our first one. I was immediately conflicted by the desire to make arrangements so I could attend and the terror of wondering if I could possibly endure the rigors of multi-day sitting with little relief. Peg offered periodic one-day sits before the intensive and I attended each one. I was in training to attend the week-long residential intensive. The days before the actual intensive were an intensive of their own in a way. We had to take our own cooking equipment because the community we were staying with would be using theirs. So in addition to planning menus, developing the grocery list, and shopping for groceries for over 21 people for seven days before the retreat, we had to load all the cooking equipment, but there was good congenial help and all the work was accomplished. Now I should say she's being um, uh, typically quite modest. She was the Tenzo. She was in charge of all of that. All the groceries, all the grocery shopping for 21 people for seven days, all of the equipment that we had to bring, big pots, the big rice cooker, huge equipment, all stashed in different people's cars to come to the intensive. She says, <clears throat> the intensive was at Lotus Lake, a Taiwanese Chan residential and retreat center. The Zenda was the most beautiful one I have seen. 
The structure was an octagon. <laughs> the interior was constructed of a beautiful, exotic, warm brown wood. At the entrance of the zendo, there was a breathtaking arrangement of clear crystals jutting out at angles, something like an asymmetrical starburst cut in half so it could lie nicely on the table. The master's chair was elevated on a platform. In front of the master's chair was the most magnificent crystal spear, sphere, sculpted from clear crystal formation, a crystal ball. On either side of the raised platform with the master's chair was displayed one half of a giant geode about one foot wide and three feet tall with amethyst crystals. It's really made quite an impression. The setting was perfect for what was about to unfold. Peg and Flint gently revealed what was occurring. A new branch of Buddhism was emerging. A birth was taking place. The Buddha had carefully and wisely established the Dharma to be flexible and able to meet the needs and conditions of the moment, the times. The Soto Zen lineage from which we arise is anchored in a monastic tradition. However, such a tradition doesn't exist in America where Zen is now practiced. The Zen practice that Peg and Flint have established is a practice of householders, not monastics. It is formed to function within and to support people living their lives in households in accordance with the Dharma. While we originate from Soto Zen, we have emerged into a new branch of non-monastic Zen. This, is actually uh, this emergence, this birth, necessitated a new name. Working with our founding teacher, Joko Beck, Peg and Flint decided on the name Abhamada, which is purported to be the Buddha's last word spoken on his deathbed in answer to his disciples' questions about how they should proceed without him. They should proceed with Abhamada, with mindful care and attention to all that is occurring. It is not an action, but a lifestyle, a way of living. What an appropriate name for a group of householders living their lives in the way of the Dharma. Speaking for myself, but perhaps also for others who were there, this was clearly a singular moment when something new and important was emerging on the planet. Like any birth, it emerged from numerous other occurrences that converged at one moment to create this new original being, idea, direction. We who were there realized how very fortunate we were to be witnesses to this momentous change. No, we were actually a part of the emergence of a new direction in Buddhism. Whether or not it will flourish is unknown, but the seed has sprouted. Lotus Lake with the community, beautiful lake and magnificent Zendo, as beautiful and perfect as it was, was the least important part of what occurred at the intensive. Mm -hmm. Yet it played a vital role, allowing the new presence of Apamata to unfold and providing a nurturing container for the unfolding to happen. Isn't that a lovely reflection? Mm -hmm. uh, she, she worked so hard as the Tenzo. It's kind of astonishing. So, our years of training, practice, and study of Zen in its traditional Japanese form gave Flint and I an appreciation for its exquisite evolution in China and Japan over centuries of refinement. Buddha's teachings had been creatively adapted to these cultures and in turn had shaped the cultures themselves. We developed a deep love and respect for these traditional forms, their beauty, profound meaning, practices, and teachings. We had immersed ourselves in temple life and followed the traditional training. Am I on the right page? Yes. <clears throat> to the extent that we were able to, without moving to Japan, ultimately all the way through to Dharma transmission. Of course, there was still more to learn, as there always is. I was especially interested in the social architecture, how traditional Zen was organized and structured to support a Sangha and the transmission of the Dharma. I studied the function of roles, organizations, physical spaces, practices, ceremonies, teachers and teachings, and administration to more deeply understand the way Zen had developed and flourished over so many centuries in temples and monasteries, in remote villages and farms, and in the homes and hearts of its lay followers. In this way, we had absorbed what would serve as the foundations of our teaching and our practices. There was just one significant issue. Our Sangha was not Japanese, and we were not monks, but people living contemporary lives in the West. We saw that what Joko had understood and how she had responded in her first teaching and stripping Zen practice down to its essentials. She recognized that we would have to remake Zen in America, but without our formal training in the traditional model of Zen, Flint and I would have no way to comprehend how. Before I left for Great Vow, I visited Joko. She said, you don't need to go to a monastery. Then she added, but you learn something, you always do. 
I told her, I can't get to where you are without following the path you took. I believe our study, training, and practice in traditional centers and monasteries provided the grounding and depth we needed to establish Appamata's contemporary model, the shape and process of an evolving spiritual ecosystem. Going forward, there will likely be no need for such traditional training in the Japanese model. We have no aspiration for training monks and priests. We are dedicated to serving householders, people living contemporary lives, filled with work, family, friends, creative endeavors, civic engagement, worries, longing, distractions, upset, dread, and delight. So we have developed and fostered this Appamata approach to Zen, a fresh start. It has deep roots in the Dharma and the profound wisdom and compassion of Zen's tradition, teachings, and practice. This contemporary model of Zen as relational practice and as an expression of care also has deep roots, not only in Zen's history and vow, but in current sciences of mind, social organization, power dynamics, and cultural forces. Who cares is our primary koan. It's sometimes said as a gesture of hopelessness, of cynical detachment. Look again. It's an existential question that connects us deeply with all that is. Our development does not follow a traditional template or social architecture, nor aspire to one. But it has not been a random walk, a grandiose delusion, or a plunge into chaos. Flint and I have devoted ourselves to the organic development of our Sangha structure by paying close attention to what is actually happening and providing both foundations in the Dharma and scaffolding for emerging relationships, deep spiritual friendships to thrive and grow as we move together in the direction of waking up and growing up. In part four, I'll describe just how that organic development unfolded as Appamata's unique social architecture evolved. Okay, just, just a little bit more. Are you okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Holding on? Okay. <laughs> okay, just a couple more, couple more pages of this. So, freed from the need to mold ourselves into the Jap traditional Japanese model as we adopted Joko's spare, simplified approach to Zen, we became explorers willing to experiment and discover what best served both the Dharma and our particular Sangha. We had ideas. <laughs> in fact, we had a manifesto, The Green Edge, which I wrote at a Soto Zen Buddhist Association conference, a little piece that reflected my questions about the directions of SCBA and the place of contemporary Zen centers such as our own in that organization of traditional Japanese style Soto Zen priests and Dharma transmitted teachers. Here's what I wrote. But first, this calligraphy, which is above, you can see above the altar. Um, it's usually translated as mindfulness, the quality of Appamata. The Japanese kanji character is in two parts. The bottom part means heart, mind, whole being. That's the little swish at the bottom. The same character for heart in the Heart Sutra, which means the same thing. The top part means right now, in this moment, and also in this historical era. It's about bringing your whole being right into this present moment. <clears throat> so here's my manifesto. The green edge. We, among others, are the green growing edge of Zen, like the growing tip of a new shoot on a plant. We are not heretics and apostates abandoning tradition or denying its <clears throat> foundational importance in nourishing and supporting this growth. The rich teachings from the Buddha down to the present day are the DNA that is unfolding as this particular flower. We are social evolutionaries. We are not revolutionaries. We do not want to tear anything down and abolish any institutions or structures. We respect tradition deeply and believe strongly in the necessity and value of traditional practice places. But we do want to grow Zen in America in this fresh, vibrant, alive direction. It is our hope that the traditional Zen organizations that bring together so many different centers and groups can find a way to honor our path as well, informing our practice, inspiring us, and fueling our sincere dedication to the evolution of Zen here and now. We feel we have something important to offer that can and should be included as a complement to the more formal, traditional practice centers. And we feel strongly that an organization that concerns itself primarily with formalism, with policy and procedures, and narrow definitions of legitimacy cannot thrive and survive in this contemporary culture. We will continue to offer what we can do best to the best of our capacities 
and our teachings will continue to be grounded in the deep traditions and teachings of Zen. They will also be informed by what we continue to learn from neuroscience, psychology, physics, social sciences, the arts, and other disciplines, as well as our encounters with contemporary students leading their ordinary lives and our warm relationship with other teachers of the Dharma. This is a rich, abundant expression of the Dharma, flourishing in its inexhaustible way on new ground. It is not so different than Bodhidharma coming from the West, or Dogen and Keizan igniting Soto Zen in Japan. The traditional forms all had their origins, dependent on the culture and the historical moment in which they arose. New forms are emerging in that same way here in the U.S. The salutary contribution of Zen practice here in the West is its potential for rich diversity and expression, and I think that is something we ought to celebrate rather than disparage. However, that said, I can certainly understand how a particular organization, such as the SCBA, might decide that its primary mission is to foster and support a strictly traditional Japanese-style Zen practice, that it needs to be the keeper of that historical flame. It is an honorable aspiration, and we would have no quarrel with that decision. It simply means other organizations that either exist or emerge will be necessary as a medium for the evolution of Zen in America. I will say, though, that it is my opinion that to head in the direction of more formalism and more emphasis on correctness and procedures is to repeat the very same dynamics that led Japanese Zen to become fossilized and moribund over time. Don't let the heart and the vitality drop out of the Dharma in the interest of the preservation of forms and rituals. Or, priests may find themselves primarily officiants at funerals and caretakers of lonely outposts and dusty temples. That was my warning. This piece was a strong challenge to conventional approaches to Zen based on the traditional Japanese model. I shared it with a newly formed group, the Lei Zen Teachers Association, in 2011. I want to add that, of course, on the other hand, <clears throat> we Americans are prone to mistaking arrogance for independence, and we can also mistake ignorance for don't know mind, and self-centered impulsiveness for spontaneity. We are convinced that we can make up our own rules, we don't want to admit that the householder life really does present many difficulties and obstacles for serious Zen practice and generally results in a divided commitment and often intermittent gaps in participation. I hope in coming together in this way, we can support and invite each other into richer, deeper, more energized and wiser teaching, inquiry and practice for ourselves and for our sanghas. So that was my manifesto. And I will read here from the little part on the previous page from Sekito Kisen, which is, hearing the words, you should understand the source. Don't make up standards on your own. If you don't understand the path as it meets your eyes, how can you know the way as you walk? Progress is not a matter of far or near. But if you are confused, mountains and rivers block the way. I humbly say to those who study the mystery, don't waste time. So we wondered, Flint and I, how could we cultivate true engagement, the quality of mindful, energetic care of Apamata in a sangha of householders coming and going on different days and at different times, and spending most of their time together sitting in stillness and silence? And that will be what forms chapter 11, which is called Encounter. So I hope this is, uh, hope this is all and there, this sign at, uh, is at Lotus Lake. Let's hold on here. This is such a great sign. There were these big billboard signs were posted all over the Lotus Lake campus. This particular one says, "Be aware of all that you know, but cannot do." Mm -hmm. so it's cautions, you know. <laughs> Does that center still exist? Well, you know, I have a, a, a worry about that because the last thing they posted was in 2015, mm -hmm. and there's absolutely no contact information or anything on the website. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's sort of a ghost website. And where is mm -hmm. it physically located? Tom Tom Magnolia, Texas, near Houston. It's oh. near Tombaugh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so so I don't know whether the drought wiped them out, the pandemic wiped them out, or what happened. Um, you know, whether they return to Taiwan or whether they're still somewhere or moved to some other place. And it's interesting because they're, they call themselves the IS community, 
So it's, it's not, it has something to do with their Chinese name, you know, but mm -hmm. for us, they were uh, calling it Lotus Lake. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was brutal to see what the drought had done to that place. Yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was very glad that we had the opportunity to practice there. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you for indulging me. It's a, um, a great thrill to me to be able to share this project as it goes along and uh, see the ways that we're trying to bring it together, all these parts, you know, Cassie uh, helps perfect all of the images. Um, and Kim has been helping um, in the studio, we have the uh, studio and Q has been helping also with um, reading, you know, making suggestions, um, proofreading, you know, giving me all kinds of support and help and encouragement um, to bring this project forward. So it may be that only you know two people are interested in it, but I still have to put it out, you know. So, so that's my that's my thought. Um, so I want to be sure that I can um, I can set out what we understand about how this all unfolded. So um, we maybe have time for a couple oh, of questions. Yes, to screen share. Okay. Have any questions? I wanted you to be able to see what we're the way we're assembling it is a kind of a it's almost a collage. But. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I didn't know anything about what happened in the house like here at the time. But what was very clear for me when you were talking is that you are really living all the history of your life, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. It is so much richness in, in the website that sometimes I really say, oh my God, we have all this, and sometimes I look at the books. And what's very clear um, for me in this moment, how of senior teachers are still leaving the legacy. Mm -hmm. Your way is writing, and Flynn is talking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's a very different way, but both of them are very, very important for us. So I appreciate that. Thank oh, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's helpful for me because you're my audience for this book. You know, other people may read it and find it interesting, but um, but I really want it to be a legacy for the sangha, so yeah. that mm -hmm. we understand where did this all come from and how much intentionality went into it, into the typeface, into the word mark, which has been worked on for weeks. Uh, so it may not look like it; it's just a simple word, right? But that was um, all part of the care that we were bringing to the whole enterprise. Okay. All right. Well, it's, it's late, you know, and um, I'm sorry to keep you so long, but I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to read this for you and, uh, and to share it with you. So, um, so we, we, uh, I'm going to mush on. The next, this next section, as I say, is about encounter. It's about the way we programmatically built in opportunities for relating mm -hmm. and bringing people together in ways that were nurturing, supportive, unthreatening, you know, kind. Mm -hmm. So that's... Um, that was not an accident. That was intentional, right? So, so I'll, I'll be talking about how we did that and how we thought about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Wow. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Goodbye. It's oh, good. sorry. No, Wait. it's. What? Okay. Thank you. Well, soon.